David set the ark of the covenant where the most high dwell and only the high priest could enter therein to offer a sacrifice for torment of sin but the veil was rent in an instant revealing that holy place for on a hill nearby on a rugged cross justice that grace I can go into the holy of holies I can be I can boldly approach the throne. There's no more required for the blood of Christ. The spotless lamb completely paid the price. In the sacrifice of worship, we'll open about the great I am uh, the bread of life yes. now today we've already talked about this message yep. we really have and today's message is going to be on I am the resurrection and the life yes. and anybody that's ever been in a club when they was younger you had a better time here today than you did in that club already, right? Yeah. Yeah. And this time was beneficial. Yeah. When we was in that club, that time wasn't beneficial. <laughs> you know, it didn't benefit us at all. Anyway, we're going to be, this message is going to come from John, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 46. 
And we're going to start with verse 3. And verse 3 says, So the sister sent word to Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. And in verse 4, Jesus, when he heard this, he said, The sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now, the Bible says in verse 5 that Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. That's who we're talking about. The sister sent word to, to Jesus, Martha and Mary. But Jesus loves all his sheep. Amen. They were his sheep, but he loves all his sheep. He didn't love Martha, Mary, and Lazarus any more than he loved any of his other sheep. That's not what the Bible is saying, that he loved them more. That's not what it's saying. And I'm sure that we all have had somebody that we care about, uh, a family member, a spouse that has become ill, and we would do everything that we could or possibly could to make that person comfortable and spend any expense to try and get that person well so they could be themselves again. Now, the Bible is saying that uh, you would probably do everything. Okay, I said that. So when Jesus heard about Lazarus' illness, he rushed right over to Bethany, right? No. Nope, he didn't go. The Bible says he stayed two days longer where he was. So if Lazarus was so ill and Jesus really cared for Lazarus, and his family, you might wonder why Jesus did immediately go to Bethany and heal his friend. Matter of fact, Jesus didn't have to go to Bethany to heal Lazarus. He could have spoke the word just like he did on many other occasions, and Lazarus would have been healed right away. Amen. But Jesus had a plan. God had a plan. Right. And we'll see uh, in a few verses why Jesus delayed and uh, to heal his friend and to see about Lazarus. So as Jesus said to his disciples in verse 7, let us go to Judea again. Now, the disciples knew that the Jews was looking to stone Jesus to death. They wanted to kill him. They asked him, Lord, are you going there again? You know, they didn't say that the Jews wanted to stone him to death, but they knew that in their hearts that the Jews wanted to stone him to death. And uh, because of something he said, and we'll get to that in a minute. Now, we got to understand in the Old Testament that God gave specific offensive offenses in which someone would be stoned to death. Now, and one of those was blaspheming the name of the Lord. As a matter of fact, in Leviticus, you don't have to put this up. Leviticus 24, 16, it says, Moreover, the one who blasphemed the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregations shall certainly stone him. The aliens, as well as the native, when they blaspheme the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. So if anybody in here blaspheme the name of the Lord, the congregation going to kill you. Just joking, just joking. Now, now there were two instances. <laughs> there were two instances where the Jews sought to stone Jesus to death. One was when Jesus said to them, and don't have to put this up, in John 8, 58 and 59, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. And in verse 59, therefore they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. And also in John 10, 30, verse 30, 32, 33, when Jesus said in verse 30, I and the Father are one. And in verse 31, the Jews again picked up stones to stone him. But in verse 32, Jesus answered, I showed you many good works from the Father. 
for which of them are you stoning me? Now, all these miracles that Jesus had performed, he wanted to know. Which one of these miracles or these works are you stoning me for? These came from the Father. So which one are you stoning me for? In verse 33, the Jews answered him by saying, For good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. So in their minds, they thought Jesus was committing blasphemy because of the things that he said in those two statements. Before Abraham was born, I am, and I and the Father are one. They thought he was co uh, uh, committing blasphemy because he was claiming to be God. But Jesus was telling the truth. He was God. He was God in the flesh. God stepped into his own creation and walked around as a man. I've heard it said that God emptied himself, but Jesus still thrived on that power of the Father. So he walked around as a man and God at the same time. Now we have to notice that in these two incidents, that it was essentially the same thing that prompted the Jews to stone Jesus in the first place. When he said, before Abraham was born, I am, he was referring to what uh, God said, I mean, uh, in Exodus 3, when the Lord appeared to Moses at the burning bush. When the Lord appeared to Moses at the burning bush, he appeared to Moses to commission Moses to go down to Egypt and set his people free. So Moses asked the Lord, who should I say that sent me? And the Lord said that I am that I am. You should tell them that I am has sent you. Now in my mind, the Jews were very familiar with this Old Testament passage. They didn't have this Bible like we got it, but they were familiar with that passage. So they clearly understood what Jesus had said. Before Abraham was born, I am. They understood that Jesus was claiming to be God. They understood that. That's why their immediate reaction was to stone him to death. Because they understood that. Also, they were not exhibiting faith. They weren't exhibiting faith at all. The Bible says that uh, every man is issued a measure of faith. Where was theirs? Where was theirs? It takes faith to get up in the morning. Yeah. It takes faith to love. It takes faith to do a whole lot of things. Where was their faith? In the second instance, Jesus had finished explaining that his sheep, eternal life, could never be lost because both he and the Father used their power to keep that eternal life totally secure totally secure he finished that statement with I and the father one and when he did that the Jews they didn't have to have a historical background to understand what Jesus was claiming to be they didn't need that because they had came to a conclusion in verse 33 when they said for the good work we do not stone you but for blasphemy and because you being a man make yourself out to be God. And once again, their immediate response was to stone Jesus. Now on these two occasions, Jesus' disciples knew the Jews wanted to kill Jesus because he claimed to be God. So his disciples, knowing that, they were reluctant to go to Bethany. Which in a way is kind of understandable because Jesus had told them in the first place that Lazarus' death, I mean, Lazarus' illness would not be his demise, that he would not die. So they saw really no reason to go back there because he was going to live. So when the disciples asked Jesus, are you going back to Judea? 
And he answered in verse 9 by saying, Are there not 12 hours of light in the day? Anyone who walks in the daytime does not stumble because he sees by the light of this world. So what's Jesus talking about? Well, first of all, the Jews divided the uh, time from sunrise to sunset into 12 equal hours. The day referred to one's life, and the night referred to one's death. Jesus was answering his disciples' question by saying that the Father had allotted him a specific amount of time for his earthly ministry. And he had appointed a specific time for him to die. So until that appointed end of his earthly ministry arrived, the Jews couldn't do nothing to Jesus. They couldn't harm him. Because God had it set up. But they couldn't touch him. As MC Hammer said, you can't touch this. <laughs> in other words, he could not stumble in death prior to God's appointed time for him. Now, I think that Jesus, he probably knew how much time he had remained on his ministry before he would go to the cross. Now, that's just me. You know, I could be wrong, but like Pastor always said, put it on the shelf. Put it on the shelf. But I do know in comparison that just like Jesus, we don't know how long it is. But you and I, we have a certain amount of time allotted to our lives right here on this earth. We have a certain amount of time to do what we can do for the Savior. We got a certain amount of time to get our lives in order and come to the Lord and do what we're supposed to do. We have a certain amount of time. We don't have forever on this earth. So we got to get it together right here and right now. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 27, and just that it is appointed and destined for all men to die once and after that comes certain judgment. So we appointed once to die. Unless the Lord comes today. And we be raptured up out of here. But other than that, we gonna die. We gonna leave this body. I mean, this body is gonna die, but our spirit is gonna be eternal. In verse 11, Jesus said to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of this sleep. Verse 12, the disciples answered, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Remember what I just said a few minutes ago? They were reluctant because they thought they was looking at the natural. Verse 33, however, Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought he was referring to a natural sleep. But Jesus was telling them that Lazarus had died. And let's think about that for a moment. I'm not surprised that they thought the way that they did, because either one of us could have probably, would have probably thought the same way. But Jesus was teaching his disciples to see in the spirit. But they hadn't got there yet. So the Bible says he spoke to them in an unmistakable term in verse 14 when he said, Lazarus is dead. Now there was no mistake in that. They, they knew exactly what he meant. Lazarus is dead. Remember that we're going to find out why Jesus delayed to go to his friend Lazarus? Well, I don't think that his primary reason for not going was for Lazarus' benefit. I don't think his primary reason for not going was for Martha and Mary's benefit. And I don't think it was for the residents of Bethany's benefit. 
I don't think that Jesus needed to finish up anything that he was doing where he was at prior to going to see about Lazarus. No, I think the, the reason Jesus waited for those two days was for the benefit of his disciples. It was for their benefit. Because he said to his disciples in verse 15, And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. The fact is, much of all the stuff that Jesus did was specifically for the training of those 12 men. Amen. He was training those 12 men. Just like Pastor and us. Everything the Pastor preaches and teaches, it's not necessarily for his benefit, it's for our benefit. God forbid. But one day, Pastor got to leave here. We all got to leave here. We may leave before he does. But he's putting us in a position. Just like Jesus put his disciples in a position where they could go once he went back to heaven and preach the gospel throughout the world. That's the same thing he's doing with us. He's putting us in a position so if he goes, we can carry on. Amen? Amen. So I think those extra two days set the stage to increase those disciples' faith by a greater demonstration of Jesus' power, meaning raising Lazarus from the dead, a greater demonstration of his power. In verse 16, Thomas spoke up and said to the fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. Now remember the reluctance that they had about going back to Bethany. Well, Thomas just conveyed that reluctance in that statement that he just made. I don't know about you, but when I think about Thomas, I want to put that adjective at his, in front of his name, Doubting Thomas. You know, because on the very Sunday when Jesus rose, he first appeared to his uh, disciples in a locked room because they were hiding in fear of the Jews. But Thomas wasn't there. They later told Thomas that they had seen the Lord. And Thomas's well-known reply was in John 20, verse 25, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger in the place of the nails, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. I will not believe. A lot of people today got to see it to believe it. I don't have to see the electricity in that socket over there to believe it's there. But if I stick my finger in there, I'm going to get shot. I can't see the air, but I believe it's there because it sustains me. I don't have to see it to believe it. What about you? <laughs> but here we see a different side of Thomas. When we observe Thomas' great courage and Thomas' willingness to face death with his Lord and Savior, he demonstrated his total commitment to Jesus, even if it meant dying at Jesus' side. His total commitment was not merely a requirement for those 12, but that's the same requirement for us today. That total commitment to Christ. Christ is always preaching on that, the total commitment with Christ. You gotta be committed. You gotta love him because he first loved you. The Bible says in Mark 8, 35, that for whoever wishes to save his life, in this world, will eventually lose it through death. But whoever loses his life in this world, for my sake and the gospel, will save it from the consequences of sin and separation from God. I don't want to be separated from God forever. 
You know how far along eternity is? As far as the east is from the west and beyond that. I don't want to be separated from God. But Jesus and the disciples, they now began their journey to Lazarus' home. In verse 17, so when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. I think a body started decomposing at three days, don't it? In verse 18, now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. In verse 19, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Verse 20, Martha, therefore, that's a beautiful name right there. <laughs> when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I don't know how she said it. She might have said it like, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't die. You know, I mean, that was a, a hint of, uh, of blame there. You know, but then again, she might have said it, Lord, if you had been here, my brother might not have died or would not have died. See, because she could have said it that way because she was exhibiting her faith in Jesus saving and healing power. But there are times in our lives when we don't receive something from the Lord or we don't get the outcome from the Lord that we really desire, how should we respond? Should we be upset and blame the Lord for not making things happen according to our timetable? Absolutely not. After all, we're talking about the Creator. <laughs> you know, it's certainly true that God desires to be and is gracious to his children. That's his desire to be gracious to us. That's his desire to make us happy. Isaiah 30, 18 says, therefore the Lord was, waits expectantly and longs to be gracious to you. And therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. Compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed, happy, fortunate are those who long for him. Since he will never fail them. And that's what the Bible tells us. That the Lord will never leave us or forsake us. He's not going to fail us, but we fail him. See, sometimes we get it twisted and think that God exists to do our will. It ain't like that when it's quite the opposite. See, God created us. We didn't create him. And God created us to glorify him and to do his will. Amen. Psalms 40 verse 8 says, I delight to do your will, O Lord. Your law is written in my heart. So, if there is something that the Lord wants us to do, we should be delighted to do it. It ain't nothing hard because he said his yoke is light. His yoke is light. We make things hard on ourselves. But when I really look at it, it seems to me that Martha needed to adjust her thinking just a little bit and focus on her role as serving Christ rather than viewing Christ as being there to serve her. Well, hey, you know, <laughs> could be that we all might need to adjust our thinking a little bit. We all might need that. Martha went on to say in verse 22, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God would give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Verse 26 says, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ and the son of God, even though even he who comes into the world. Now, that's a lot right there. That's a whole lot. Let's see if we can break this down a little bit. Now, first of all, Martha believed that the resurrection was an event. But Jesus showed her that the resurrection is a person. When he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha knowledge of eternal life was an abstract idea but Jesus proved that knowledge of eternal life is a personal relationship yeah. it's a personal relationship that personal relationship is believing and accepted what he did at Calvary Martha thought victory over death was a future expectation that's why she said he will rise again on the last day Pastor just said this this morning. Jesus corrected her, showing her that victory is in present reality. He just said that this morning. We got it now. We don't have to wait on it. If we follow Christ, we got it now. All we got to do is believe in what Jesus did at Calvary. That he died. That he was buried. That God raised him from the dead. That he's seated at the right hand side of the Father. We have eternal life right now. Now Jesus made some dramatic claims about himself. But they weren't empty words. He demonstrated that with truth. I am the light of the world. He opened the eyes of a blind man that was born blind. I am the good shepherd. He laid down his life for us. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He provides our only access to God. I am the bread of life. He fed 5,000 women and men with five loaves and two fish. That's practically nothing. So when Jesus claims in this passage to be the resurrection and the life, it's not all surprising that he backs it up with claims of, and with uh, dramatic proof. I'm not going to read verses 28 through 32 because it talks about Jesus' exchange with Mary and the Jews consoling Martha and Mary which was kind of similar to the same uh, conversation that he had with Martha. But we're going to pick it up in verse 33, which says, Jesus therefore saw her weeping, I'm talking about Mary, and the Jews who came with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Verse 34, and said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35 says Jesus wept. He cried because he loved him. He loved him. He loved the Lazarus. Not that he loved Lazarus more than anybody else because he don't show partiality. We have to remember that. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. Verse 37, but some of them said, could not this man, talking about Jesus, who opened the eyes of a blind man, have kept this man from dying? Yeah, he could. Because Jesus deeply cared for Lazarus, but also would be moved by the very tangible evidence of sin, which was death. Because the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. 
because Jesus saw death. Now, I'm not saying that Lazarus died in sin or anything like that. But when Adam was disobedient and Eve was disobedient in the garden, death came into the world through sin or disobedience. So Jesus in verse 38, again, very deeply moved within, he went to the tomb. Now, it was a cave, and a stone was laying against it. At verse 39, Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time, there would be a stench, for he has been dead for four days. Verse 40, Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? Now, the reason I'm laughing is because, once again, Martha is second guessing. She's kind of objecting in a way because there's going to be a stench. But Jesus, as gracious as he is, reassures her and perhaps gave her a mild rebuke that if she believed, she would see the glory of God. Then the tomb was allowed to be open. Verse 41. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. 42. I knew that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. Now, you get that? Yeah. He said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but he was doing that for the people. Anytime Jesus spoke, the Father heard him. Anytime we speak as Christians, the Father hears us. But he was doing this for the people that were standing around. When he had said these, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Verse 44, the man who had died came forth. Wow. <laughs> Bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to him, to them, unbind him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. Verse 46, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Now to me, and this is just my thinking, they went and told the devil what Jesus had done when they went to the Pharisee because they wanted to kill him too. They wanted to kill Jesus and Lazarus because Lazarus was living proof that Jesus had raised him from the dead. And, and Jesus didn't put on a big show like you see some shows on TV where these people are doing all this healing and stuff and they put on this big show and stuff like that. Now I'm not saying that they ain't doing that, don't get me wrong. But he didn't put on a big show. He didn't have a long prayer. He didn't have a long sermon. He just stated a simple, straightforward command, Lazarus, come forth. And immediately, Lazarus came up out of that tomb. He walked out of that tomb, even though he was still complete, completely brown, bound by those wrappings, Lazarus had been loose from the cords of death. His body had been restored to life. Now, he was still a mortal body, and it had to die again. It would be only a matter of days before Jesus himself would die. And then, as the first fruits <laughs> rise victoriously from death, Jesus' resurrected body would be immortal and it would never die again that's our hope that's our hope that when we leave this body we gonna get a, a new resurrected body that ain't gonna never die again never have no pain ain't gonna never have no sickness can go through that wall right there 
I want to go to China, think about it, boom, you're there. It's a blessing, it's a blessing. Now watch this. After Lazarus came from that tomb, Jesus immediately involved some of the people that were present in the miracle. First of all, he commanded them to unbind him and let him go. He involved them in it. Earlier, he had directed them to remove the stone that sealed the tomb. He involved them in it. By having those people participate in that miracle, they could be sure it was really happening and that it was authentic. He does that same thing today. He involves us in miracles. He involved me in a miracle. He did. I went to the doctor for a heart catheterization. And I flatlined. Now, I still got the burn marks right here. They didn't have time to put the pads on. They just had to hit me with that electricity right away. They hit me four times. I only remember one, the first one. And when they hit me with it, I said something that I can't repeat. <laughs> <laughs> and I passed out. And I passed out. Okay? Now, I didn't even know about this. But Martha told me. She said, honey, you know that you flatline, and Dr. Hangel said they had to shock you four times. But see, that was a miracle of God. God involved Dr. Hanger in that miracle to bring me back. It wasn't Dr. Hanger that did it. It was God Almighty that did it. Amen. Through Christ Jesus, my Lord and Savior. <laughs> hey, you got a little sheet of faith, I'll tell you. <laughs> and there's all kinds up in here, man. <laughs> it's fun, though, I tell you. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Uh, <laughs> now, John gives us no details of the joyous reunion uh, with the sisters and Lazarus in his second life. The Bible is silent on that. But one thing he does tell us is the two different responses that those who had uh, firsthand witness of this incredible miracle. The first response, John relates, is the response that you would expect for someone who actually witnessed an awesome miracle like this. Since it was obvious that only the power of God could raise the dead, the people humbled themselves and believed in Jesus. That was one of the responses. It's kind of hard to imagine if you present when Lazarus was raised from the dead than having any other response except believing in Jesus. Any other response don't make any sense to me. But there were some present who refused to believe. There are some folks that refuse to believe today. Amen. Instead, these folks went and reported to Jesus' enemies, the Pharisees, all that Jesus had done. Today, we look at their response. How could they possibly reject the Savior after being a first-hand witness and even a participant to such an amazing miracle. How? And how could the Pharisees, after hearing the report, plot not only to kill Jesus, but also Lazarus? Because like I said, he was living proof that Jesus had raised him from the dead. Only a few days later after Jesus' crucifixion, those same Pharisees heard the report 
from the guards that Jesus had risen from the dead just as he promised. How could they bribe the guards and make them lie and say that the disciples came and stole Jesus' body? How could they possibly not only reject the truth, but actively suppress it to prevent others from hearing it? Same thing is happening today. People are out there trying to suppress the truth. And this is the truth, this word right here, to keep other folks from hearing about God and about Jesus Christ. They're doing it all over the world. Not just here in the United States, they're doing it everywhere. They're doing it in the jungles. They're doing it everywhere. How is it possible? How is it possible? Jesus tells us how. Jesus says in John 3, 19 and 20, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that their deeds may be exposed. How is it possible? It's not difficult at all for men who need to be born again to a new life in the Lord when they love darkness and hate the light. In fact, it's quite normal and natural to them. For someone to do otherwise would be to act against their own nature. Saints, the truth is, it's unnatural for anyone to turn from his sin and turn to the Lord. It's unnatural. For that to happen, it requires God to perform a miracle in that person's heart to override that old sinful nature. Amen? Amen. Today, people fall into the same two categories as they did in Jesus' day. Saints, I'm here to tell you this morning, there is no neutral spot. No neutral spot. Everyone either makes the decision to believe and align himself with God, or he chooses to remain in Satan's camp as an enemy of God. If we do not know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are just as spiritually dead as Lazarus was physically dead. Lazarus us, or us don't have the power ourselves to have life. We don't have that power because we simply cannot save ourselves. Jesus Christ alone can give us life. Jesus Christ alone is the resurrection and the life. Jesus Christ alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And Acts 4.12 says it all. It says... And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name on the heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Church, now we and those that are listening to this message know exactly what Jesus meant when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this message. Father God, we thank, we pray that this message would touch the lives of those that is going to be listening to this DVD. And Father God, we pray that they would make some kind of step forward to Christ Jesus and involve him in their life and, and accept him as their Lord and Savior because he is the resurrection and the life. One day he's coming back. And we want to be ready. And we want those to be ready that are not ready. And Father, we just give you praise, honor, and glory right now, Father. And we lift up all those who don't know you. And we thank you now, Father. We thank you that you chose us before the foundation of the world. You chose them too, the ones that don't know you. But they just got to make a decision and come to you. 
Father God, we thank you that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We thank you that you secured our salvation through the Holy Spirit. And Father, we just give you praise, honor, and glory right now. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, our Lord, our Savior, our God, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Amen.